Happy almost Thanksgiving. Uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for this morning. Um, thankful for this time of the year as we give thanks for everything you've done for us. Look forward to uh, the next month celebrating the birth of your son. Looking forward to the month after that as we look forward to the things that you're going to do in the new year. I do pray, Lord, that you would have your way this morning at Sugarland Bible Church. I do pray for the illuminating ministry of the Spirit, whereby he takes the deep things of God and makes them known to us. We do invite him to do that, both in the Sunday school hour and the main service that follows with all of the different classes that are meeting, even now as I'm speaking. And in preparation for that ministry, we're going to take a few moments of silence to do personal confession before you, not to restore broken fellowship, but not to restore position, rather, but broken fellowship if need be. We're thankful, Lord, for all of your promises, particularly 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. We're thankful for the comprehensiveness of your provision for us. Help us, Lord, to press into your truth. There's a lot of um, things out there that are distracting us very easily. Help us to focus this morning on what matters, what's eternal. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, if you could locate the book of Second Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 3. Um, continuing in Sunday school, our verse-by-verse -verse teaching through... Second Thessalonians, Paul writing there in verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, better said the departure, unless the departure comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So, as you know, Paul had been pushed out of Thessalonica, uh, having uh, planted the church there in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. Pushed out of that area by the unbelieving Jews down south into Corinth. And it's there Paul gets wind of a problem. The problem is described in the prior verse, verse 2 which says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord is not the day of Christ, you'll notice. That's going to become important in a little bit. But the day of the Lord is basically the tribulation period. Uh, this is not the first time Paul has addressed the tribulation period. He addressed it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2 after telling them about the rapture in chapter 4. He described what would happen next. He says, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So he's describing there something that would overtake the earth like a thief in the night after the church has been removed. Uh, that is not the day of Christ, okay? The day of Christ is a happy thing. Um, if a thief breaks into your house in the middle of the night, that's a bad thing, right? So the day of the Lord is essentially what's gonna fall upon the world after the church has been removed. 
a day in the Bible has an evening and a morning, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, the evening is the tribulation period, which will last seven years. The morning is the breaking forth of the dawn after the night is over, and that is the manifestation of God's eternal kingdom on the earth after Jesus comes back at the end of the seven-year time period. So Paul had taught them over and over again that you would not be in that initial part of the day of the Lord. So they had received a letter, allegedly from Paul, but it wasn't from Paul, basically teaching them a different theology that they would go through the tribulation period. So that's where post-tribulationalism you know, started in Christianity, <laughs> that you would go through the tribulation first. Um, it started from a forged letter. So their whole belief system comes from a forgery, when you think about it. And I just bring that up because they're always criticizing where our view comes from. You know, they try to link it to Darby and all these other things. And my response is, well, your view comes from a forgery. So, so there. Um, <laughs> I say it, though, in a more sanctified way, though, usually. <laughs> so Paul had taught them, no, you're here. You're in the church age waiting for the rapture. They, had, they, with this forged letter, came in and said, no, you're here. You're in the tribulation period. So you can see how receiving a forged letter like this would unsettle them. In fact, as you back up there to verse 2, they were shaken by this. Meaning, Paul, you just changed your theology. And if you just change your theology, then we can't trust anything else you say. So that's why they're so unsettled by it. Because he had taught them something different. So what Paul is doing in this paragraph verses 3 through 12, is he saying, you're not in that time period. You're not in the day of the Lord. Contrary to what this forged letter says. Because if you're in that time period, you would see five things, which you're not seeing. And the first of which is the most controversial, so we've been sort of drilling down on this one of late. Um, the apostasy, which I think is better translated, the departure. So the, depart the issue here, as you know, is the departure from what? And there's two major views on it. Is it a departure from the word? When Paul says you haven't seen the departure yet, so most people say, well, you haven't seen the doctrinal defection of the church yet. A better interpretation of it is no, you haven't seen the departure from the world yet. Meaning that Paul is, according to the second view, using the departure as a synonym for the rapture. So is this a departure from the word or is it a departure from the world? Well, we went through the departure from the word options, kind of showed the problems with those. So I'm of the persuasion, and the more I've been looking at it, the more solidified I'm really getting in my own perspective on it, is it's really speaking of the departure from the world. In other words, the apostasy, which just means departure, better translated, the, the departure, hasn't happened yet. I told you about that in the first letter, that you would be removed before the day of the Lord hit. That departure hasn't happened yet, so you're not in the day of the Lord, so you can just take this forged letter allegedly coming from me, and you can file it in the circular file, you know, meaning the garbage can. And the reason this has become such a big deal in our day is because it says there, the departure comes first, proton. And as you know, there's a big debate on the timing of the rapture. Pre-trib, which is the view that we hold at the top of the screen. Mid-trib, we're raptured in the middle of the tribulation. Post-trib, we're raptured at the end of the tribulation. 
something called pre-wrath, very misnamed by the way, very deceptive name, but we're not raptured until three quarters into the tribulation period. And if Paul is actually saying the departure comes first, then it's what we would say game, set, match for the top view, pre-tribulationalism. Because the departure happens before anything else on the list. So I have a little booklet on the, that you can get at the back table if you haven't gotten one. Um, talking through the 10 reasons why I believe this is talking about the departure from the world. I don't think any one argument seals the deal, but when you look at them cumulatively, they form a, a powerful case for pre-tribulationalism. There have always been doctrinal departures, so how could another one be a sign of the end times? Second Thessalonians was an early letter. Paul is not dealing in his early ministry with predictions about the last days, doctrinal departure of the church. There's a definite article in front of the noun there, apostasia. So he's not just talking about some generic falling away, he's talking about a specific event. And the definite article is also in front of the coming of the Antichrist. So we have two definite articles here. So if the coming of the Antichrist is gonna be instantaneous, so is this departure. And some kind of gradual doctrinal defection of Christianity won't get it done. I've tried to show that both the noun and the verb can refer to a physical departure. So when you have a word that means many different things, you obviously would follow the context, <coughs> which would show you the meaning of the word. So both the extended context, the First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonian books taken together, and the immediate context favors the physical departure understanding. Uh, why doesn't Paul just say rapture, if that's what he meant, because he's reviewing material? And he has many different words at his disposal. And then I tried to show you that regardless of the theology of the earliest English translations before the King James came around, uh, all of them, although they may not have held to our brand of theology, all of them were honest enough in their translation to translate that word as the, as the departing away. The departing away happens first, which fits better the departure from the world view. So I'm here on number 10, um, my 10th reason. And I wanted to throw this in here because when you start to talk like this, people will say you're crazy. No one ever teaches this. Never heard this before. Um, you know, I'm looking at my favorite uh, Bible study commentator, whoever he is. And they're all saying this is doctrinal. And you're saying, no, it's physical. And so what people will do is they'll make you feel like you're just out on a limb. You're coming up with some view that no one has ever held before. So I have here number 10 um, that, yes, the view is not the majority view, but there's a lot of very good people on the side of the departure from the world perspective. Here is a chart that I put together showing you all of the people that hold to a physical departure understanding. And you say, well, Pastor, every time you put that chart up, it looks like it gets bigger. And that's true. You know why? Because during the week as I'm studying it, I find somebody else that held the right view, what I would call the right view on this. Or people send me articles from people that I didn't know existed. And so it's been kind of neat putting this together just to demonstrate that this is a well-known view, this physical departure understanding. The ones with the asterisk by it are ones that I'm giving you a quote from them. <clears throat> But in general, you've got Kenneth Wiest, E. Schuyler English, J. Dwight Pentecost, H. Wayne House, Stanley Ellison, J.S. Maybe, Alan McRae, 
Gordon Lewis, Henry Morris, John Rice, Dave Olander, J. Carl Laney, Grant Jeffries, who I just discovered held the view two weeks ago. Myron Houghton, a new name on there, and I just discovered he held the view, I just made that discovery this week. Paul Lee Tan, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Tim LaHaye, Thomas Ice, Don Stewart, Bob Thiem, Gordon Olson, J. Vernon McGee, Jimmy DeYoung, J.D. Farag, David Hawking, Jimmy Swaggart, Chuck Smith. So let me share with you this uh, citation from uh, Dr. Myron Houghton, uh, who taught, uh, and maybe he still teaches there as far as I know, Faith Baptist Theological Seminary. And this is what he said back in 2002. And what he's doing here is he's giving four reasons uh, why the physical departure view fits. A Greek scholar. Reason number one, the reason the word which is translated falling away can refer to a physical departure. Note that this argument does not say that the word always or even normally has this meaning. But departure or disappearance is the second meaning given for this Greek word in a Greek-English lexicon by Liddell and Scott. You're saying, hmm, I've heard that somewhere before. Because that's one of the points that I've made as we've been talking through this. Part of the problem here is that the word is only used twice in the New Testament. Here and also Acts 21, 21, where Paul is told that some accuse him of teaching a departure from Moses. In this latter passage, this word is used in the sense of religious apostasy. In the Septuagint, this word or an older form is found in Joshua 22, 1 Kings 21, 2 Chronicles 29 and 33, Isaiah 30 and Jeremiah 2. In these cases, the word also has the idea of a religious departure. However, Either the context or a descriptive phrase is used to indicate that a religious apostasy is meant. So when people say, well, it only means spiritual departure, in all of those other cases, there's some kind of descriptor thrown in, like departure from the faith or, you know, some kind of overriding context demonstrating that you're dealing with a religious departure. You don't have any such descriptor here in chapter 2. And what, In fact, what you have in chapter 2 is a context overwhelmingly talking about the rapture. Therefore, it might be argued that the word itself was more general in the New Testament. The verb form of the word is used 15 times. We've covered that. Of the 15 references, only three have to do with a religious departure, and these three are qualified by the context or a descriptive uh, phrase from the faith or from the living God. It is clear from some of the remaining references that a physical departure is meant. The angel who delivered Peter from prison uh, Paul prayed that a thorn in the flesh might, be, might depart from him. This word, now he's getting into the English translations. This word is translated departing away by William Tyndale in his English translation. Cramer, Cramer in his English translation. The Geneva, study, the Geneva Bible, an English translation. Biza translated it departing. So what he's doing is he's rehearsing some of the arguments I've already shared with you. Look at the context. When it's used of a doctrinal departure, there's a context that supports it. When it's used of a physical departure, there's a context that supports it. And that's true with both the noun and the verb. So context is king. 
Reason number two. The use of the definite article the lends, lends support to the view that the falling away is the rapture. The basic function of the article is to point out an object or to draw attention to its use. Its use with a word makes the word stand out distinctly. And there he quotes a, a Greek grammar supporting his point. Paul is not speaking about a falling away, but the falling away. What he says is the departure. In all probability, Paul is referring to some subject he has previously discussed with the Thessalonians. Gee, what, what prior piece of information has he discussed with the Thessalonians? The rapture. In fact, when you go back to chapter 2, verse 1, he's talking about the rapture. You could go back into the first letter, chapter 4, chapter 1, the end of those chapters, he's talking about the rapture. So when he says the departure, he's referring back to something he had already taught them about. He hasn't taught them earlier about some sort of doctrinal departure of the church. He's talked to them about the rapture. So when it, it doesn't just say departure, it says the departure, meaning it's referring backward to something that he had already focused on. Paul is not speaking of a falling away, but the falling away. In all probability, Paul is referring to some subject he has previously discussed with the Thessalonians. A.T. Robertson agrees with the use of the article in this verse. He states, and the use of the definite article, the, seems to mean that Paul had spoken to the Thessalonians already about it. Now, if this is the use of the article in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, one would expect to find a place either in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians where Paul previously referred to a departure from the faith. This writer, Myron Houghton now speaking, knows of no such reference. However, there is a previous reference to the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. So he doesn't just say departure, he says the departure, bringing back to their minds information about something he's already covered. What has he already covered? The doctrine of the rapture of the church. Reason number three. Paul's, writing, Paul's style of writing in this chapter also lends support to the idea that the falling away is the rapture. In verse 3, Paul states that two events must occur before the day of the Lord can come, namely, the falling away and the revealing of the man of sin. Paul's reference to this second event seems to be more fully described in verses 8 and 9. If indeed this is Paul's style, then verses 6 and 7, which describe the removal of the Holy Spirit and the church, would be a more detailed explanation of the first event in verse 3, the falling away. So if you take the departure as the rapture, that fits very nicely with the rest of the chapter. Because typically what Paul will do is he'll introduce an idea and then give a full explanation of it later in the chapter. So if this is the rapture, that would fit his writing style because in verses 6 and 7, he's giving a better description of the rapture. If you take this as some kind of doctrinal defection, then you have Paul making a point and then kind of having a senior moment where he forgets what he's talking about and goes on to a different topic entirely. So it's a bit odd you know, to hold to that view that this is a departure from the word because here you have Paul making a point and then forgetting about it and going on a rabbit trail into an unrelated subject. That's what Myron Houghton is bringing up here. Reason number four. Uh, 
We covered reason number three, didn't we? Okay, I, I ha I'm having a senior moment there. All right. Reason number four, Paul's purpose in writing led support to the view that the falling away is the rapture. Remember the setting. The Thessalonian believers were being persecuted for their faith, and they thought they were in the tribulation period. Paul writes to them that they can't possibly be in the tribulation period because two things have to occur before the tribulation period can begin the falling away, and the revelation of the man of sin. If religious apostasy is a means by which Paul expects the Thessalonians to know whether they are in the tribulation, then he has failed to prove his point because there have always been religious apostasies. Even in the time of the apostle Paul. And the Thessalonians were not in a position to distinguish any present form from the apostasy. However, if Paul was referring to the rapture of the church, then the Thessalonians could know with certainty that they were not in the tribulation period. Hey guys, you're not in the tribulation period. Why not, Paul? Well, because the apostasy hasn't happened. What does that mean, Paul? Well, that means doctrinal apostasy. The Thessalonians would come back with a question, well, that doesn't help us with anything because there's doctrinal apostasies happening right now in Thessalonica. So a doctrinal apostasy could not be some definitive sign that the church is in the tribulation period because we have doctrinal apostasies right now. So he must be referring to something else. In other words, another doctrinal apostasy would not be some demarcating sign. But the physical removal of the church would be a sign that would be unparalleled. That's uh, Dr. Houghton's second point. Um, here's J. Vernon McGee. You guys all know him, right? Very um, wonderful radio Bible teacher. Uh, in fact, when I, whenever I listen to him, I, I feel like he's talking about today. <laughs> it's almost like he's describing the things that are happening in our country right now. And this is a gentleman that's been with the Lord for decades because he was just a very faithful verse-by-verse -verse teacher. And as we know, God's word is living and active. So what does J. Vernon McGee say about this verse? Quote, Paul says that before the day of the Lord begins, there must come a removing. There are two kinds of removing that are going to take place. First, the organized church will depart from the faith. That is what we call apostasy. But there will be a total apostasy when the Lord comes that cannot take place until the true church is removed. The Lord asked... When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, verse 18. When he says the faith, he means that body of truth which he left here. The answer to his question is no, he will not find faith here when he returns. There will be total apostasy because of two things. Number one, the organization of the church separated from faith, it has apostatized. But number two, there has been another departure, the departure of the true church from the earth. The departure of the true church from the earth uh, into the total apostatizing of the organized church. The day of the Lord cannot begin, nor the great tribulation period begins, until the departure of the church has taken place. And what he is saying is, I'm going to play both sides of this. Is this a departure from the word, or is it a departure from the world? J. Vernon McGee says it's both. What he's saying is God is going to physically take his church out of the earth. When that happens, there'll be no believers left on planet earth. 
the only thing left will be organized Christendom filled with unsaved people. Organized Christendom filled with unsaved people. And I, and I hope we understand this. The day after the rapture, um, there's a lot of churches. Let's say the rapture takes place on a Saturday. I can't promise that. But if it takes place on a Saturday, a lot of churches are going to have their ordinary church service on Sunday, and the preacher will be there, the choir will be singing, uh, the crowd will fill up, because the church is filled with unsaved people. And if there's any believers in the midst, they'll be removed, and organized Christendom will quickly be merged into the great harlot Revelation 17, called Babylon. So what he is saying is, when Paul says that the apostasy or the departure must come first, it means two things. Number one, the true Christians will be removed. So he's embracing here the physical departure of the church. And number two, once all true Christians are removed from organized religion, there's really no force left to keep organized Christendom on the right path and organized Christendom without any regenerated people in its midst anymore will quickly be merged into the harlot called Babylon. So basically what he's saying is it's both. So you listen to a lot of people talk, is it a departure from the word or a departure from the world? And a lot of people say it's both. Um, that kind of solution is very appealing to a postmodern mindset because the postmodern mindset tries to escape tensions like this by carving out a middle ground somewhere. And although J. Vernon McGee certainly is not, was not a postmodern thinker, a lot of people have embraced his view because you get the best of both worlds. Um, I don't completely agree with what J. Vernon McGee is saying. I agree with what he's saying, that it's speaking of a physical departure, but then this other interpretation he gives, that it's organized Christendom with no regenerate people in it any longer, merging into the harlot called Babylon. I don't think a word can have two meanings like that. It's an ancient or well-respected hermeneutical principle Milton Terry, uh, in his book on hermeneutics, qu says, quote, a fundamental principle in grammatico historical, historical exposition is that words and sentences can have but one significance in one and the same connection. The moment we neglect this principle, the principle of single meaning, in other words, we drift upon a sea of uncertainty and conjecture. So I'm not completely on board with what J. Vernon McGee is saying, that the word basically means two things, um, because I'm a single meaning guy. I think it's talking about the physical departure of the church. But at least J. Vernon McGee and his understanding of it has as part of it a physical departure perspective. Uh, Dave Olander, who taught and continues to te teach Greek at Tyndale Theological Seminary, has a little book out called The Greatness of the Rapture. And he writes concerning this verse, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, apostasy has a basic root meaning of departure, de departure from or standing apart from. In other words, the word just means depart, <laughs> Well, depart from what? The question in 2 Thessalonians is a departure from what? Context, boy, these guys sound an awful lot like myself, don't they? Context is the key for understanding many words in the text. Scripture uses the term apostasy in several ways. Paul had written to the Thessalonians about another departure of the church the rapture, in other words, and her gathering together unto him. This is the rapture and a legitimate use of the word departure, stand apart, or apostasy. 
Historically, the word can easily mean this. And there he quotes Liddell and Scott, which has physical departure as one of its meanings. Once the church has departed, been raptured, there is not one believer left on the planet. This would be a total and complete apostasy in several ways. In essence, one departure or an apostasy causes the other, and Paul could have easily used the word he did, referring to a secondary part, those left behind on the planet in total. So uh, Dave Olander is basically saying what J. Vernon McGee said. Apostasy has a twofold meaning. Physical departure from the earth, all true Christians, leaving only organized Christendom left on planet earth with no regenerate people in it, um, and that system filled with unsaved people will, will merge into the Antichrist's one world religious system called Babylon. But notice that Olander and McGee are both, as part of their understanding, understanding this as a physical departure. Um, Jimmy DeYoung, now with the Lord, longtime prophecy teacher, writes this. Our key verse for this devotional, this is, was in his newsletter, verse three has become somewhat controversial. You can say that again. There are those that believe that the Antichrist will come when the falling away of the church, the apostasy in the church has happened. This then seems to be saying that the church will be here when the Antichrist appears. This belief comes from a wrong understanding of the Greek word used in this passage and translated a falling away. A close and careful word study of the Greek word apostasia will conclude that the true meaning of the word is found in the phrase departing from one place and going to another, not a falling away from the doctrines of the church. If the word apostasia was communicating that the apostasy was what it was talking about, then the rapture and the second coming of the Antichrist would have to happen during the writing of 2 Thessalonians. Apostasy had infiltrated the church by the time Paul wrote this passage. What Paul is saying here is that the Antichrist, the son of perdition, would not come until the church departs from one place and goes to another. That is what happens at the rapture. The scenario for the, future, for the future, according to all prophetic passages, is that the rapture takes all Christians into heaven and then the Antichrist appears on the earth. Let me remind you that all preparations have been made for the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Jimmy DeYoung was for a long time a resident in Israel. False teachers and deceptions presently are a part of our society today, which indicates that the Antichrist is nearing his appearance on the earth. Remember, before the appearance of the Antichrist and the temple is built, the rapture happens. Actually, the rapture could happen at any moment. Be ready. <laughs> I like that. So he's making a couple of points that we've already made that look, this can't be a doctrinal departure because if this is a doctrinal departure, that wouldn't be any real sign that you're in the tribulation period because doctrinal departures are normal, very sadly, within the church age. And beyond that, if you take this as first the doctrinal departure of the church has to happen before the Antichrist can show up, then all of a sudden you're putting something first. You're no longer looking for the return of Jesus because the doctrinal departure of the church has to happen first. So what you're doing, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to get into the weeds on this, what you're doing is you're actually damaging the doctrine of eminency, which is the idea that Jesus can come back at any moment. 
There is no prophetic sign that has to transpire before the rapture can occur. There are many prophetic signs that have to transpire before the second advent happens at the end of the seven years. But as far as the catching away of the church, there's no prophetic sign that anything has to precede it. It could happen at any moment. But if you're telling me that the doctrinal departure of the church happens first, suddenly I'm looking at not the, the heavens in terms of Jesus coming at any second, I'm looking at the state of the church, saying, well, the doctrinal departure has to happen first. And what you're doing is you're damaging the doctrine of eminency because you're placing something before, something has to happen before the rapture. But if the departure is a synonym for the rapture and the departure happens first, then the doctrine of eminency is preserved and protected. See that? Chuck Smith. Um, Chuck Smith started, I mean, the Lord did it through him, obviously, started a worldwide movement in the late 1960s into the 1970s called the Calvary Chapel Movement, uh, the Jesus Revolution. Chuck Smith is basically the instrument that got that whole thing moving. Um, I'm sort of a great grandchild of the whole thing because I was raised in Southern California and I got saved in the early 80s while a lot of that was going on. So it was a scenario where you had all of these uh, youth, you know, with their long hair and their hippie kind of lifestyle, just aimless youth, no real purpose in life. And what started to happen with the Calvary Chapel movement is these people started to get saved. And I mean, they got saved in mass, like giant blocks of them. Uh, I remember talking to a lot of different people about this, how at my high school, now this didn't happen when I was on campus, but it did happen at my high school, that all, like all, the whole high school gets saved. I mean, it was just unbelievable. It was, um, I don't know what to call it other than an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it didn't result in weirdness. <laughs> Because a lot of things people do today in the name of the Spirit, people just get weird. The Calvary Chapel movement wasn't a perfect movement, but the product of it was verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching, was reintroduced to Christianity. So Chuck Smith was sort of a stickler on, you know, teaching the whole Bible simply. And they brought in um, a kind of a contemporary style of worship. That's where Maranatha music and things like that came from. And it was like a home for that particular generation of lost youth. And it was Chuck Smith, his wife Kay Smith, and her influence over him that when you look at their story, um, really got that whole thing move moving. So I find this very interesting today because there are people that are influenced by the Calvary Chapel movement. I don't know if it's a majority, but there's a couple of people, if I called out their names, um, you'd probably recognize them. But they are totally against this view that I'm giving here. Totally against the physical departure of the church. You know, th this is heresy and all these kinds of things they're saying. And I'm thinking to myself, you guys need to check the historical record because Chuck Smith himself held to this view, the physical departure view. Um, and it's one of those things where I was at a conference involving a lot of Calvary Chapel guys and the gal that organized the conference, she comes up to me and she says, you know, Chuck Smith uh, held, held to the view that you teach. And I said, you're kidding me. And I go, where, where, where does he hold to that? So she sent me on her phone his uh, commentary on 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. And lo and behold, there it is. 
So this is what Chuck Smith says in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. The day of the Lord referred to here is the day of judgment. Falling away comes from the Greek word depart. This may refer to the rapture of the church. Look at that. For the day of the judgment will not come until the rapture. Or... It may be a reference to people departing from the faith, for Paul spoke of another departure. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. And used the same Greek word. However, in the 1 Timothy passage, Paul added the words, depart from the faith, instead of depart alone. And what he's stating here is the obvious. The word can be departure from the world or departure from the word. Well, departure from the word is obviously what it means in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 because what did Paul add to the description of a falling away? But the Spirit, 1 Timothy 4 1, explicitly says in the latter times, some will fall away. What's the next part of the sentence from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons so what Chuck Smith is basically saying here is yeah it can mean departure from the faith but when it means departure from the faith it will say departure from the faith when you look at 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 does it say from the faith doesn't say it at all it just says the departure comes first If Paul wanted to be specific and say, you know, I'm not talking about the rapture here. Really what I'm talking about is the last day's doctrinal departure of the faith. Paul could have been crystal clear. He could have added the expression from the faith, which he does in his latter writings. He does not do that here. So Paul is not talking about, according to Chuck Smith, because he leaves out that descriptive clause, some sort of doctrinal defection from Christianity. He's talking about the rapture, which is the overriding context of 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. A classic book that, if you're interested in eschatology, that you should have in your library is the book by Paul Lee Tan, called The Interpretation of Prophecy. Now I'm quoting here from the revised reprint and expanded edition, but this is something that goes back to the 1970s. It's just as as classic as Dwight Pentecost's book, Things to Come. In fact, if I understood it right, this was part of his, or was his doctrinal, doctoral dissertation at uh, the Grace Brethren Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana. So I was very interested in what he said about 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. And lo and behold, he says it's the rapture. Paul Lee Tan, and I went to school with his sister. We were in the doctoral, not his sister, his daughter. We were in the doctoral program at the same time. He says, quote, what precisely does Paul mean when he says the falling away must come before the tribulation in chapter 2, verse 3? The definite article, the, denotes that this will be a definitive event, an event distinct from the appearance of the man of sin. The Greek word for falling away taken by itself does not mean religious apostasy or defection. Now, it can mean that if you add a qualifying phrase from the faith or if you have some kind of context dealing with doctrinal defections. The Greek word for falling away, but but the word by itself just means to depart. So you're asking yourself, depart from what? The, the word itself will not solve the problem for you. The Greek word for falling away taken by itself 
does not mean religious apostasy or defection. Neither, neither does the word mean to fall, as the Greeks have another word for that. The best translation of the word is to depart. The Apostle Paul refers to a definitive event which he calls the departure and which will occur just before the start of the tribulation period. This is the rapture of the church. The Apostle Paul uses this word, the verbal form of it anyway, in 1 Timothy 4.1. Some shall depart from the faith. The necessity for qualifying the word with the phrase from the faith shows the word taken by itself has no such connotation. So what Paul Lee Tan is saying is exactly what Chuck Smith says. If Paul wanted to say this is a doctrinal departure, he would say a departure from the faith, which he does elsewhere, but he doesn't do it here. So you can't just look at the word and say, well, it always means doctrinal. That's not true. It just means to depart. The issue is depart from what? The word or the world? Context answers that question alone because the word can go either direction. Jimmy Swaggart. Oh no, pastor's really going off the deep end. Um, I, look, <laughs> Jimmy Swaggart, anybody can make mistakes, right? Christians still have a sin nature. Yours truly included. And if you don't think you still have a sin nature as a Christian that you have the power to say no to, but if you don't think it's still there, then Satan already has you beat. Because how do you fight an enemy you don't even believe exists? So yeah, Jimmy Swaggart messed some things up. Um, to my knowledge, the man is repentant. Um, you can quibble with me on that if you want. I continue to believe that Jimmy Swaggart is probably, even though I don't agree with every little part of his theology, is probably one of the most gifted orators and, and musicians for that matter because he has musicians in his family tree. You know, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. I think the guy that came up with that is like his, somebody in his family tree, but something like that. But um, I think Jimmy Swaggart is one of the most gifted musicians, and I think he's one of the most gifted orators. I'm not talking about his fruit of the Spirit. I'm talking about his gifting in the Spirit, which is a different thing. I remember as an unsaved person, as a little kid, um, turning on the television and watching him on TV and just saying to myself, wow, this guy is extremely gifted. And just because you mess something up doesn't mean that the gifts of God disappear from your life, right? Because Paul in Romans 11 verse 29 says the gifting and the calling of God are irrevocable. So, so Jimmy Swaggart made some bad choices, probably may have related to bad theology, not understanding the reality of the sin nature within the believer, pretending like it's not there. But that doesn't mean uh, I take everything the man has ever said or done and just throw it out. Those gifts are still there. God... God <clears throat> gave him those gifts. And to develop a mindset that says he should be thrown out and let's just get rid of the guy and no one should ever listen to him ever again, I'm not of that perspective at all. I, I believe people are repentant. Uh, I believe people need a time of restoration. But once that time of restoration is complete, I say put him back into the ministry. A lot of people will disagree with me on that. If you mess something up in the ministry, you're gone. Okay. Have you read the book of Psalms lately? Let's just get rid of the book of Psalms. Just chuck it. 
Because do you realize that most of those psalms were written by David after his uh, murder? His murder, pretty bad. That's a pretty, that's a pretty bad one. After his adultery and murder. A lot of those psalms are right there in your Bible about his repentance and the hand of God in his life. So I'm, I don't have any problems quoting Jimmy Swaggart, although theologically <clears throat> we would be different on a lot of things. Uh, I continue to have respect for a penitent Jimmy Swaggart. So he has this uh, thing called the Expositor's New Testament. Um, I'm not really crazy about how they designed this because he puts his own commentary into the text in red. I kind of think red is for Jesus. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm a little bit, you know, geez, I don't think I would ever do something like this. I would put my comments in the footnotes. But anyway, all of that to say, in his, the Expositor's New Testament, he's con and he is um, a very big voice in what's called AOG, Assemblies of God. So what I'm trying to show you is that this physical departure understanding goes across Christendom. It goes across the denominational spectrum. It's not just some isolated view that somebody came up with. So Jimmy Swaggart says, for that day shall not come except come a falling away first. And he puts his own comment in parenthesis. Should have been translated, for that day shall not come except a departure comes first. That speaks of the rapture, which in essence says the second coming cannot take place until certain things happen. So you'll notice in his commentary, he's taking a physical um, departure understanding. So all of this sort of talk about heretic for teaching this, heresy, strained exegesis, uh, departing from the normal dispensational tradition, all these people that level these charges. There's a lot of people you're going to have to call a heretic if you're going to say stuff like that. You know, you can call me a heretic, you can call me anything you want, but you're also throwing a rock at all these people simultaneously. Because I didn't come up with this view on my own. I'm walking down a, a path that's been very well trodden. So that becomes um, sort of my 10th reason uh, why I think the physical departure view works. So we're done with that, right? Not quite. Because there's five objections to the view, which I'll go over next time. And then once I go over those, we'll finally be departing from the departure <laughs> teaching. And then we'll get into the verse-by-verse -verse study. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. Help us to be good stewards of it and to handle it correctly um, in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the, uh, the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Happy.